Start. Okay, so uh, the second speaker of today is going to be Amar Haji Hasanovich, who is going to talk about the smash product of neural theories and comes from the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. Uh, please, Amar, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you and thank you to the organizers for letting me speak here. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to talk at Itaca, also because it gives me the opportunity to tell people that I am actually Italian, uh, even though my name doesn't sound Italian, because I think that uh, most people who do not know me personally would not assume that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my most recent uh, paper, which has the same title as the talk. Uh, so it's a smash product from other theories. It's, it's, it's in the archive. Um, but uh, the theory behind it is also largely um, exhibited in this other earlier paper called Diagrammatic Sets and Rewriting in Weak High Categories. That's kind of the technical background of, of it. Um, at the same time, the, the work kind of there's a little bit of a, of a tie to, uh, to about the Tholen's work in that uh, this work also stems from, uh, in a way it stems from Bourbonnais' work, in this case, uh, um, his uh, discovery or rediscovery of the theory of polygraphs, uh, also called computats in the context of rewriting theory. But, uh, so the, the main point of the, of the paper and the talk is about uh, uh, building this bridge or relation between two different constructions, which uh, um, when, you, when you look at them, do not seem particularly related. So the first one um, is uh, this tensor product of, of props. So let me say a few words about uh, about what props are. So for me, a prop is always going to be a colored prop. And this is one of the gadgets that people consider uh, as a way of presenting or, or embodying uh, a kind of generalized notion of an algebraic theory. So one way of describing a colored prop is that it is a symmetric strict, strict monoidal category T, small monoidal category T. Um, whose objects are freely generated uh, by the monoidal product from a set of uh, elements that we call sorts. And uh, the idea is that the more, so here, uh, because, the, because the objects are freely generated uh, uh, from, from a set, we can, we can identify them with lists of sorts. And so morphisms uh, from uh, the list A1 to AN to the list B1 to BM uh, can be interpreted as operations that take n inputs of sorts a1 to an and the return m outputs of sorts b1 to bm. And uh, these morphisms can be composed in a nice way of, of uh, getting an intuition of how they can be composed is by representing them in uh, string diagrams. So this same thing is a n to m operation uh, can be pictured as a string diagram with, uh, I'm, I'm reading these from bottom to top. So this has N incoming wires labeled A1 to AN and M outgoing wires labeled B1 to BM. And the way that these can be composed is by connecting any finite number of their, uh, of the outgoing wires of one with the incoming wires of the other one. Uh, including that number can also be zero, in which case this would be just the horizontal juxtaposition of, uh, of these two diagrams. So any any uh, any connection like this one can be composed to another operation. And um, furthermore, because we we are in a symmetric one of the categories, so we can also permute the wires, which uh, means that there are these structural morphisms given by the 
the exchange of two wires. So that allows us to connect uh, to connect wires even when uh, uh, they're not in the correct order. So um, color props are uh, somewhat more general than, than other similar gadgets. Uh, in particular, we can identify symmetric and colored operats uh, with props whose operation can be decomposed into uh, composites of single output operations, so things that take n inputs and return just one output together with symmetric gratings. So there is an, in an operat, we don't have any kind of genuine uh, genuine operations with uh, with multiple outputs. Uh, we can also identify uh, multi-sorted algebraic theories in, in, in low V sense with uh, props that are Cartesian, meaning that the symmetric monoidal, the underlying symmetric monoidal structure is is actually Cartesian. Um, so we can we can form a, a category of these things and. Uh, there's kind of a slight technical point here that in my in my paper I consider a slightly different category of props from the one that people usually consider because uh, uh, I allow a morphism of props to be a symmetric monoidal functor that uh, can send that has to send a sort either to another sort or to the monoidal unit. Uh, so I somehow I I also allow sorts to be collapsed to the unit that. It's a, it's, a, it's a very minor uh, thing that doesn't, it doesn't change what the notion of model is. Um, what is a model? A model of a prop uh, can be taken in any symmetric monoidal category. And uh, it's simply a symmetric monoidal functor from the underlying symmetric monoidal category of T. So, um, we can we can take all models in a given symmetric monoidal category and form a category uh, whose uh, morphisms are the monoidal natural transformations. And uh, the important point here is that this category itself admits a symmetric monoidal structure. And the idea is that uh, if we take we take two models. Uh, we can build a kind of a tensor of these two models by interpreting every operation by you know, having the interpretation of the operation in one model next to the interpretation in the other model, and uh, then use symmetries to redistribute the inputs and outputs uh, until they are in the, in the correct order. Uh, so this 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 uses um, kind of intrinsically uses the, the the fact that we have a symmetry a symmetric monolith structure on M. Uh, so that said, because we have a symmetric monolith category of models, we can take another colored prop S and consider its models in this symmetric monolith category, and then uh, we have this. Uh, monola structure and the category of props, which can be described universally by saying that the tensor product of two called props is determined by uh, the fact that we have a natural isomorphism between models of this tensor product of T and S in M and uh, models of S in the category of models of T. So this is one of those monoidal structures that in which uh, really the most natural thing to describe is the closed structure. And, uh, and then we get the tensor product by, by, a, by an adjunction. Um, so we have that with this, with this definition, the tensor product forms uh, is part of a symmetric monoidal structure on this category of props. So this was proven by Philip Hackney and Marcy Robertson. And uh, the monoidal unit is the single sort of prop of permutations, is the one who's, uh, uh, that only has n to n operations and they're given by permutations of NYS. Uh, so we can, if we restrict to these full subcategories that I, uh, that I mentioned earlier, so restrict to symmetric operands, then we recovered uh, 
what is what is known as the Bodman Vought product of symmetric operads. And if we restrict to Cartesian props, then we uh, both of these so that they are they are closed under this one all the structure and we're in, in case of Cartesian props we recover the, the so-called tensor product of algebraic theories. Uh, so for some examples, there is a there is a single sorted prop which is in fact also a symmetric operad uh, whose models in a, in a symmetric model category are, inter are internal monoids. Um, and the models of uh, it's so well, one thing that we can take on any color prop is the, to dualize it, so just uh, reverse the direction of, uh, of the morphisms. And models of its, of its dual, uh, it, the, well, so this is still a colored prop and its models are commonoids. Something you can do is uh, take the tensor product of this mon with itself, and that actually gives us another single sorted prop whose models are commutative monoids. Now, if we take the tensor product of mon with its, with its uh, opposites, so with the theory of commonoids, we get a theory uh, whose models in a symmetric model category are bi-algebras or bi-monoids. And uh, the more general fact is that taking any prop T and then tensoring it with the uh, with the um, with the dual of the theory of commutative monoids, so the theory of commutative commonoids, gives us the free Cartesian prop and T. So this this is a way of describing the left adjoint of the inclusion of Cartesian props into all props. Okay. So this is the this is the first uh, this is the first construction that that we are interested in too. And the other one is uh, a classical construction of topology called the, the, the mesh product of pointed spaces. Uh, so if we take two pointed topological spaces or so spaces with a base point, and uh, we assume that we, uh, we, we take a kind of a nice a category of nice topological spaces, for example, completely generated house door spaces, um, then, uh, the smash product of two pointed spaces is defined as constructed in this way. We take the Cartesian product of the two spaces, and then this Cartesian product is, uh, is fibered over both x and y with the projections. And then we take we can take the fibers in x times y of, uh, of both base points of x and y, and then we quotient them down to a point. And then, well, this 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 space is going to be naturally pointed with the quotient of, of, of both of these fibers, which, uh, which intersect in, uh, in the pair of the two base points. Um, so, and that's, so that gives us a pointed space. And uh, this, uh, this mesh product is part of the symmetric monoidal cloak structure on pointed spaces. And its monoidal unit is the it's the pair of two points, so it's a co-product of the one point with another point pointed with one of the one of its two points. Uh, you can also see this as the, the zero sphere. So, as a as a typical example of a smash product, we take any pointed space X and we smash it with uh, uh, the the circle, so the one sphere pointed with any of its points, uh, we get something that's called the reduced suspension of the point of the of the space. And in particular, if we take iterated suspensions of the circle, we get the sequence of all uh, n spheres, um, of topological n spheres uh, uh, with, uh, with one of their points. Uh, so these are the two, the two protagonists are questioning why on earth should these two be related? One belongs to universal algebra, the other belongs to uh, cla classical topology and homotopy theory. Um, so I'll, I'll spend some time uh, kind of giving you an idea of why, why this could plausibly be true. Um, so first, uh, an, an observation that was kind of the starting point of this 
it's that uh, well beyond props so as a symmetric one like uh, i kind of consider a prop as an embodiment of what's sometimes called a symmetric monoidal theory uh, we may consider as a further generalization we can consider uh, pros uh, which uh, in which uh, the underlying monoidal category is, is non-symmetric and we consider props in which the underlying uh, monoidal category is, is, is braided so these are these are kind of intermediate between between these so we can form category of these of these things exactly like we form the category of props and what we have in terms of the relations that there's an embedding of, uh, of the category of props into props so these, these, these form a full subcategory so it's a, it's a property of a prop to be a prop uh, whereas it's structure on a pro on a pro to be a prop so there's a forgetful factor and both of these have left out joints so, uh, we can we can describe this uh, this kind of reflector R as uh, the one that kind of universally um, universally kind of makes the braidings here symmetric, so identifies the braiding with uh, with kind of its its inverse with uh, with the two objects switched. Uh, whereas this uh, this is a more of a kind of free algebra type left adjoints so this is the one that just uh, uh, freely adds braidings to to uh, to pro okay um, so we have this we have this kind of phenomenon where the for example the theory of monoids and of co-monoids that i mentioned earlier they're kind of naturally planar theories in the sense that well as props they are free props on a pro, and the way of kind of seeing that is that both their kind of in, in terms of one presentation of these theories, their generators and their equations do not involve any braiding. So these are uh, we can we can present the theory of monoids by taking um, a kind of a binary operation um, corresponding to the multiplication and uh, a unary operation corresponding to a unit, and then we have these three. An associativity equation here, and the left and right unitality equations here. None of these involve any 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 symmetry, so they are presentations of a, of a planar theory. Uh, however, if we and then that's the same for the theory of commonoids, of course, because that's just a dual that doesn't that doesn't introduce any any radius. Uh, however, if we take their tensor product as props, that's that's no longer. Uh, it's no longer a free prop on a pro. And in fact, in the theory of bialgebras, that's, uh, that's their tensor product. One of the uh, kind of the typical presentation of this theory, there is this, uh, this equation pictured here, uh, where we have on the left side, left hand side, we have a braiding that's, that we can't we, we can't eliminate. Uh, so something that this tells us that there is no there is no internal tensor product and pro and so this this tensor product does not um, and um, there there is also no kind of clear way that we can try to uh, just mimic the definition of the tensor product of props to to get something on pros. So there. Are, there is there is no kind of sensible way that we can find an internal tensor product in pros like this. Um, so I a few well a few years ago I was kind of thinking about this equation um, as, a, as, a, as a PhD student and uh, I kind of I, at some point I, I, I came up with a kind of topological interpretation of, of what is going on here. So something that we can take is take these diagrams that present the generators of, of monoids and commonoids. So take, for example, this multiplication diagram and kind of extend it in space. So before it's something like topological graph, now it's like a branching surface. And then do the same for kind of the commultiplication of, of, of commonoids. Extend it also to get a branching surface, but extend it in a you know, kind of perpendicular 
direction. And I'll take these two surfaces and make them intersect. And after making them intersect, slide kind of slide this upwards and slide this downwards, or maybe it's the other way around. Now slide this upwards and slide this downwards. Uh, so if you take the if you if you look at kind of the you know, the trace of how these two surfaces are intersecting, uh, as as they kind of slide one past another, the shape of their intersection changes in this in this way. Okay, so you kind of see it, it reaches a kind of critical point where the branching on this side passes through the branching on this side, and then it kind of turns from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. And uh, the point is that if we if we kind of try to project these two diagrams on a on the plane, uh, we get something that looks a lot like this picture here. Um, so what what is what well, what is going on here? So one way of of uh, approaching this is I think of uh, if you if you know about this idea of, of uh, John Bias and James Dolan of the periodic table of, of n categories. Um, so this, this is this kind of this periodic table that goes to higher n, but the kind of low dimension, this has been kind of fully worked out in a, in a couple of works by, by Eugenia Chang and, and, and Nick Gursky. Um, so low dimensions, this uh, is saying that a monoidal category uh, can be identified in a certain sense as with uh, well, a loop space and the only zero cell or the only object of a, of a bi category that has only one object. By loop space, I really mean the endomorphism category with, with a kind of an algebraic structure. Um, whereas a braided monoidal category can be identified with a twofold loop space of a tri category with a single zero cell and no non degenerate uh, one cells. Okay. And so, one way of kind of trying to see this, this, this picture of the sliding surfaces is that we start from diagrams in monoidal categories, in planar, just planar monoidal categories, uh, which are through this kind of picture. They are like two dimensional objects. And what we get is a kind of move or equation of diagrams of three dimensional diagrams of so things that, that somehow live in a, in a, in a tri category. So if, uh, if the two sides of this picture are kind of three dimensional, then you can see this move as something extended in space or something that is four dimensional. Okay. Um, so it's kind of from from something from something from two planar things we get something braided and uh, in fact one way of kind of seeing this reflected is even though we don't have we don't have a tensor product of pros producing a pro but we do have some kind of external operation we can tensor two pros and get a prop in a way that is compatible with the with the tensor product of props in the sense that if we take the three props on two pros and then tensor them in the sense of tensor product of pros, we get the same that we will get if we take this external product, get a prop, and then use this reflector to get a prop. And uh, I, I will make a kind of soft hand wavy claim that in fact, this, this external tensor product is in a certain sense, the combinatorial core of this tensor product. Like if you, uh, if you look at like one way of defining the tensor product of props is to take this external product of their, of their um, underlying pros uh, reflected, and then also kind of do an additional quotient where we're basically telling uh, we're basically telling the, the tensor to remember the symmetric braidings that already existed in the, in the two factors. Okay, and uh, 
So in fact, what I'm going to what I'm going to relate to the Smash product is not directly the tensor product of props, but it's going to be this external tensor product. And at the end of the talk, if I have time, I'll tell you about a, a kind of a nicer way of of, uh, of kind of thinking of the original tensor product of props. Uh, so okay, um, so pro is not a general monoidal category; it's a, it's a strict monoidal category. Uh, so we can look at the periodic table of before and um, kind of look at the stricter version of it. So now a pro uh, is specific, well, it's actually it's underlying monoidal category is a strict two category with a single zero cell. Uh, a prob can be identified with uh, uh, a gray category uh, with uh, a single zero cell and no non-degenerate one cells. So a gray category is not a strict three category. It's this semi-strict notion of a tri-category where you have um, kind of non-identity non interchanges, uh, but uh, you still have strict associativity and unitality equations. Um, so, well, these objects are naturally pointed because they have a single zero cell. So now if we, if we make a kind of leap and think of high categories being spaces and are made of, of directed cells, we may see a pro as being a loop space of a pointed directed two type in the sense of homotopy theory and the prob is a twofold loop space of a directed three pointed directed three type. And again, I'm using this in a bit of a hand wavy way, but that's the, that's the intuition. That's something that, that kind of should make you at least uh, see the, the, the connection with smash products as something slightly more plausible. So next I'm going to tell you a bit how we, how we kind of go on to, to make this connection formal. Uh, so the, well, when I kind of started working on this, the first kind of, the first thought was like, well, can we use just strict, can we, can we work with strict uh, high categories? And uh, the fact that we, here we have gray categories tells you that no, we, we can't, um, because we, we will need some kind of framework that can at least kind of encompass both like well, two categories, but also these semi-strict uh, and categories. Um, so this, well, the, the, this whole thing kind of evolved into something a bit more uh, comprehensive and just trying to formalize this result. And uh, that's, that's this theory of diagrammatic sets um, that's developed in this earlier, in this paper from, from last year. So the aromatic set is, uh, well, the, the name is borrowed from a kind of notorious paper by, by Mikhail Kapranov and, and Vladimir Wojewalski. Um, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to give you uh, an idea of what a aromatic set is. Well, one way of, of seeing it is that it's just a kind of generalization of various kinds of uh, pre sheaf category used in, in, in models of uh, homotopy types or of high categories. Um, so it's a pre sheaf on a shape category that's a, that's a kind of very rich uh, category of shapes that uh, includes, it includes kind of globes. So the, the, the kind of, the, the, so it has a, it has um, actually reflexive globular sets as a, as a full subcategory. Uh, it, uh, it contains oriented simplices, and, and, uh, so it has all simplicial sets as a full subcategory. Uh, it contains cubes. It even contains uh, what uh, what Marek Zawadowski calls positive opitopes. Uh, so it's a yeah, it's, it's a way of taking taking a lot of shapes, but still having good properties. Um, but mainly, it's it was it's meant as a kind of homotopically sound replacement for, well, replacement or alternative for, uh, for Bourbonnais uh, theory of polygraphs. So for, for those who know a little bit about polygraphs, um, there is kind of context for, uh, 
writing kind of unified concept of writing theory based on strict higher categories and actually on freely presented, uh, free, freely generated um, strict uh, strict higher categories, which is a uh, it's kind of it's heavily built on this idea of a high category as a as a kind of generalized space uh, because these polygraphs are somehow defined as formal cell complexes in the category of, of strict omega categories. Um, but because of these kind of problems with, with strictness, uh, somehow this, uh, this kind of analogy of polygraphs as being, uh, being cell complexes as, uh, cannot really be made uh, factorial. It, cannot, it doesn't have a kind of good sound uh, realization in, 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 in topological spaces. So this is meant to be like dharmatic sets are kind of something that's uh, meant to be similar to polygraphs in practice, but uh, also be kind of sound for rewriting and in, 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 in homotopy theory. And finally, it can be it can be seen as a kind of notion of directed space. Uh, in a, in a kind of in the vein that people in, in, in direct algebraic topology look at, but with uh, not with a point set model of what a directed cell is, but with a combinatorial model. Uh, so I'm going to give you a few definitions. The, the underlying idea is that one of the basic combinatorial things that people do in combinatorial topology is to take a cell complex and uh, associate to it uh, its so-called face bow set. So the, we start from a cell complex and we only remember the information of uh, what, what uh, cells lie in the boundary of, um, of other cells. So for example, this thing on the right uh, is supposed to represent a, a simple kind of um, CW model of, um, of a disk uh, with uh, two zero cells, zero and one, two one cells B and A and one to cell top, and its corresponding face bow set is here on the, on the left. So we've got A and B being covered by by top in the, in the, in the partial order sense, and zero and one are covered by both by A and B. Uh, so something we can do is instead start from a, from a pasting diagram that makes sense, for example, in a strict higher category. A globular strict high category um, associated to it is face posted together with an orientation. Uh, so for nice, so this only works for nice diagrams, but um, the idea is that not only we remember what cells are in the boundary of other cells, but we also remember whether they are in the source uh, or the targets or in, in the input and the output, which is the terminology that I use. So here, for example, or this is a, a kind of simple pasting diagram. And uh, we, one way of kind of uh, making, this, uh, making this orientation idea is that we annotate the Hasse diagram, of, uh, the, the, the diagram representing, the, the, the graph representing the covering relation uh, with, uh, with pluses and minuses. So here, this is saying that B is in the output boundary of top and A is in the input boundary of, of top. So the, how do we formalize this? This relies uh, on, um, on a work by Richard Steiner from, from 93, called the Algebra of Directed Complexes. Um, so again, we start from a finite post set and we call an orientation a finite post set and edge labeling of its Hasse diagram with, uh, with uh, pluses and minuses. And then we restrict to so-called graded post sets, which are the ones in which uh, kind of elements have a kind of an intrinsic dimension or, or rank given by uh, kind of how, how long the chains uh, in, the, in the Hasse diagram under them are. And, um, so we, we work with these oriented graded poses, which are finite graded poses in orientation. And the nice thing is that just from the structure of an, of an oriented graded poset, 
taking a, a downward closed subset of this both set, we have a kind of intrinsic notion of what the output and input boundary of this of this of this closed closed set is. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into details of how, but the point is that just from these data, there is a there is a kind of one sensible notion of what the input and boundary and the output and boundary of every closed subset is just given in terms of this structure. Uh, so the idea is that now we want to kind of restrict to kind of nice uh, to nice kinds of closed subsets which somehow uh, correspond to uh, things that we can interpret as pasting diagrams in a, in a straight omega category and they're the ones which we can kind of decompose so in a strict omega category of composition of cells here we want to decompose things uh, as globular compositions. So we, uh, we look at these specific closed subsets called molecules. So we call something a molecule if either it has a greatest element and in which case we call it an atom or it kind of can be subdivided properly into a union of two molecules with, uh, with fewer elements. Uh, whose intersection is exactly the output and boundary of one and the input and boundary of the other one. So the idea is we can decompose them as a kind of composition in the lobular sense along uh, the n-dimensional boundary. And now we actually want to restrict to particularly nice molecules called molecules with spherical boundary, um, which are the ones for which the um, these are kind of particularly nice pasting diagrams in which uh, the intersection of the output k boundary and the input k boundary of u for all k smaller than the dimension of u is equal to the entire k minus one boundary of u. Uh, I'm going to explain this in a picture. So the idea is that all these three are pasting diagrams that make sense in a, in a two category, right? But the first two have a spherical boundary, but this one does not have a spherical boundary. And uh, because uh, if you, if you in, in this one, the, the input one boundary of this one is this whole arc here, the output one boundary is this arc. And you can see that they intersect only in these two points and that's exactly the zero boundary of this thing. But this one, uh, its input one boundary is this arc here, its output one boundary is this arc here, and you see that they intersect also in a, in a point in the middle. And, um, but the, kind of topologically, the idea is that if you look at the whole one boundary of this diagram, it is a circle. But uh, if you look at the whole one boundary of this diagram, it's not a circle, it's a, it's a wedge of two circles. Okay, this is uh, the, the, this idea is, is not due to me, it's due to Simon Ari. So the, now we define uh, this nice class of oriented graded post sets called regular directed complexes, um, which are the ones for which these three axioms hold. Uh, so well, we ask that every atom, so I have the closure of every uh, element is has spherical boundary. Well, this is always a molecule, and we ask that it has spherical boundary. Then we ask that boundaries of atoms are molecules. So, kind of molecules are closed under taking taking boundaries. So, the uh, boundary of a diagram is a diagram. And also, we ask for this relation, which is the kind of usual kind of globularity. Um, relation that you have for globular sets where if you take iterated boundaries uh, it's the same as kind of taking uh, the the boundary of the right dimension with the orientation of the last one we took okay and then we also have a kind of a nice um, a nice uh, notion of uh, of a map of regular directed complexes uh, which is a function that uh, it's a function of their underlying sets, which is compatible with these boundary operations for all, 
orientation for all n. So these things form a category, a category of regular related complexes. And um, so we have some, we have some nice, uh, we have some nice properties here. So first of all, we, if we take the underlying poset of a regular directed complex, uh, we get the face poset of a regular CW complex. A regular CW complex is one in which the, the gluing maps with which we glue uh, cells are um, homeomorphisms with, uh, with their image. And uh, these are kind of well known in, in combinatorial topology as being kind of spaces that are somehow determined by their combinatorial structure. Because a regular CW complex structure is determined up to a cellular homeomorphism by its face poset. And in particular, the underlying poset of a regular n dimensional atom is going to be the face poset of a regular CW n ball. So the idea is that these regular atoms are somehow a nice, um, a nice model of um, a nice combinatorial model of a kind of oriented. Uh, oriented and ball. So if you forget the orientation, we get something which is arguably a nice combinatorial model of a ball. Plus, we have an orientation which somehow makes sense for an interpretation in, in a, a space in diagrams. So, the, well, what, what was the grammatic set? Well, we take the full subcategory of this this category on only the atoms, so on the, on the ones in the, diagram, the regular director complexes that have a greatest element. Uh, well, we take skeleton of it if we want things to work this nicely. And then we just take pre sheaves from this. And that's, that's so it's a, I mean, the idea of uh, you know, spaces modeled on things in this category here, we have space modeled on these combinatorial oriented and balls. Um, so we this uh, the, this category has a kind of has a nice monoidal structure, not a non-Cartesian one, uh, which is a form of the of the gray product. You may you may know about the gray product from straight tie categories or from some cubical models of, uh, of higher categories. So this has a this has a counterpart in this setting where, which is particularly nice to define and compute. So if we take two oriented graded post sets and we take, we just take our Cartesian product as post sets. And uh, there is only one good way or, or let's say, or, or, well, or two dual ways of, of giving it an orientation, uh, which is a little bit like the way that we uh, give that we that we define um, boundary maps in the tensor product of chain complexes. If you, if you know about this, um, in particular, we get kind of we get a we get a monoidal functor to the category of chain complexes given by just linearization um, uh, by taking like free the free chain complex on these graded process. Um, so if uh, so this, this is just the this is just uh, how we, we kind of tensor together two oriented graded both sets. And if P and Q are regular directed complexes, we get a regular directed complex, and that's what we call the grade product. Now, if we restrict this, for example, to, to, to cubes, um, then we, we get the same thing as, as the, the usual kind of uh, product inducing tensor product cubical sets. So this great product extends to it. it. It's part of a monoidal structure, so it's compatible with maps. It restricts to a monoidal structure on the atoms, and uh, and then by the kind of usual uh, kind of day convolution um, machinery, we get a monoidal biclosed structure on a category of diagrammatic sets. Um, so this, this, as I was saying, this product is not, it's not a Cartesian product, uh, it's, uh, but, uh, but it is the next best thing. And so it's a semi-Cartesian product. The unit object is the terminal object. 
Um, so we still get that the gray product of two spaces is phi bird over both x and y, because through in some microdigital product, we still get projections by, by kind of sending x or y to the, to the, to the unit. Uh, so this, this this fact allows us to just basically mimic the definition of this mesh product of spaces and define a kind of gray's mesh product of pointed aromatic sets, and that's going to be part of a monoidal bicolor structure of pointed aromatic sets. Okay. So going very fast to the point. Uh, I was saying that aromatic sets, the reason about aromatic, uh, behind aromatic sets is that I wanted to uh, do rewriting, but also have a nice, uh, a nice realization functor, a nice geometric realization functor. So there is a, there's an adjunction between the aromatic sets and uh, spaces, and that lifts to a, a, a nerve realization pair relating pointed aromatic sets and pointed spaces. Um, so what we what we have is that this realization sends great products to Cartesian products, and in fact it sends smash products to smash products. So okay, this is a, these these pointed aromatic sets are going to be kind of our bridge between the, the world of monoidal theories and the world of pointed spaces. This is one one of the ends of this bridge. So the bulk of the of the article, which I'm, I'm just going to basically state things, is uh, the definition of uh, adjunctions uh, that relate aromatic the, the category of the aromatic sets, and specifically pointed aromatic sets, the category of pros, and that's that's quite easy actually to define. The hard work is uh, finding a, a kind of non-trivial adjunction which actually relates the aromatic sets and gray categories, so gives. Uh, gives a faithful functor from gray categories to, to diagrammatic sets, which, uh, which, restricts, um, which restricts to the to functor from uh, these, from probs to pointed diagrammatic sets. So the, this is done through a kind of a big kind of chain of constructions if you want, which is summarized in this big diagram. And I'm just uh, the, the bits that are important to the statement of the theorem are the ones marked in red. So I was saying, this is this adjunction between the aromatic set and gray categories. And uh, we have this uh, G functor, which is a kind of realization of the aromatic sets in gray categories. Uh, then we have this um, kind of nerve functor it goes through this, this is, you shouldn't worry about this, but the point is that uh, we can compose this with this right adjoint N and get a, actually an embedding a full and faithful functor from the category of pros into the category of uh, the grammatic sets or pointed, or which kind of lists actually to pointed aromatic sets. And finally, we have this way of, uh, of kind of including props into the category of gray categories um, through this Q3 functor, which is not actually, um, it's not an adjoint, it's a composite of a left adjoint and a right adjoint, but it has a nice property that's a, a pseudomonic, which is uh, kind of one way of formalizing what an injective functor is. That's basically saying that if a gray category comes from a prop through U3, then it comes unique from a unique prop. So if something is the underlying gray category of a prop, it is so in a, in a kind of essentially unique way. Okay. And then the main theorem is that we have this big uh, diagram of commuting functors. So this is saying that on the top end of this functor, we have this external product of pros. And then we have this kind of way of including props into gray categories. And on the bottom end, we have uh, we take the nerve, kind of this, this nerve, so you embed pros into pointed aromatic sets. Then we take the smash product uh, by, in which we also invert, we, we, there, there's kind of slight subtlety because we have to invert the direction of some, 
of some cells. But uh, so there's a slight drought involved, but it doesn't, it doesn't change much. And then finally, we take this realization in gray categories. Um, and this, the, well, this diagram commutes up to a natural isomorphism, which, uh, as I was saying, because so the basically the image of this chain in gray categories is always going to end up in the essential image of this of this functor here, and by this pseudo monicity, this means that from the gray category that comes from this chain, we can uniquely reconstruct a prop, and that prop is going to be this external product. So this is the main theorem. Um, I would I have. The rest of the slides is, uh, well, it's mainly trying to give you more of a kind of an idea of why this happens and, uh, and how these smash products and gray products look like. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have because I can't remember when I started. So uh, right now we should be in question time. So can of I- Of course you're the last speaker. So if you have something to say, you can still go on, but maybe let's not go too far. Yes, maybe I'll, I'll skip. I'll skip a few slides about gray products, um, and I'll just uh, I'll just kind of return to. I'll just give a kind of conclusion to this. Um, so once well, this is this is kind of um, what I said is that so that there's a kind of way in which this uh, this mesh product. Um, this mesh product you know, subsumes the, the tensor product of props, uh, or at least these external tensor products of pros. But uh, it's like the way it does actually it goes through a functor. It goes through this functor from uh, from diagrammatic sets to gray categories, and that's a that's a functor that loses some information. Um, basically, well, the diagrammatic set can have oriented cells in arbitrary dimension. A gray category can have non-identity cells only up to dimension three. Uh, so for example, um, in this mesh product, we will have some kind of oriented four cells, which will become equations for the tensor product of pros. Okay. Um, uh, because, because this embedding of, uh, of pros into the right sets is, is, is full and faithful, we can we can always kind of work instead of instead of taking the nerve of a pro, we can work with a, we can have something like a diagrammatic presentation, like we have a diagrammatic set that presents the pro to the left adjoints to this functor. So we kind of replace, uh, you know, for example, in computing this tensor product, we can replace uh, n of a pro with a presentation. Uh, so for example, we can work with a presentation that has oriented three cells and that has nice computational properties like a convergent presentation of a, of a theory, for example. And then if we start with some, something like that from some like presentation with nice computational properties, then if, uh, if these presentations have interesting oriented N cells, then there's mesh product will have interesting oriented K cells up to two N. So it has a lot of high dimensional information and uh, the idea is that we start from this presentation, then this mesh product uh, produces not only a presentation with oriented equations of these tensor product, but it also produces some high dimensional coherence data, uh, what is it's, it's known in homotopical algebra as, uh, as syzygies, oriented syzygies for this presentation. Uh, from the point of view of rewriting theory, you can see this as data which tells you, which tells you in a, in a, in a nice way that some critical branchings in your presentations uh, are going to be confluent. Uh, so for example, if we start from a presentation of this theory of monoids with this orientation, uh, then we get a presentation of the theory of bi algebras with oriented equations. And this, for example, this presentation will have some new critical branchings which do not come from the critical branchings of this theory. But luckily, uh, this mesh product is also going to have some five dimensional cells. And these are going to be coherence data, which tells us that these critical branchings are confluent. So for example, we have this kind of critical branching here, where you start from this diagram, 
you can apply either um, either uh, an associativity equation or you can apply one of these by algebra equations. And then you have these five cell, which tells you that this critical branch is, is confluent. And then you also have, finally, you also have a six cell, which tells you, which is a kind of higher CCG, which tells you the critical branches of CCGs are also confluent. So I, I kind of end with this with this question of like where we, if we start with presentation with nice computational properties with nice homotopical properties do we not get nice presentation to a tensor product and uh, to conclude um, I'd, uh, I'd like to say that well this is uh, this has been about pros and pros which are kind of low dimensional objects if you look at it through this periodic table lens. But in the harmonic set, as well, I was saying we can we can present higher algebraic theories and with oriented generators in an arbitrary dimension, and this is through this idea of a, of a cagedly monoidal n-dimensional theory, where uh, which is in the periodic table, this will correspond to kind of k-fold direct and loop space, um, which for k equals one and two that gives us that reduces to monoidal and braided monoidal. And through this mesh product, if you if you start with this kind of definition of being kind of um, k tuply degenerate, uh, if you use mesh an n tuply monoidal theory with a k tuply monoidal, we get an n plus k tuply monoidal theory, uh, which in the case where these k and n are one, tells you exactly that this mesh product is a kind of dimension increasing operation, which from two planar monoidal theories gives you braided monoidal theory. And I think kind of a better way of seeing why, why this tensor product is closed is kind of a, an internal operation for props, but not for pros or props. Well, it's because symmetric monoidal is in, in the homotopical word corresponds to the property of being stable, um, which is a way of kind of saying, oh, this is actually a, a n-fold loop space up to infinity. Uh, so it's entropy monoidal for each end. And that's that's kind of a way through this framework of seeing why it's not it, again it's more of an idea at this stage because I don't have a I don't have a kind of I would have to have some kind of embedding of props as you know as a tr three just triply monoidal aromatic sets which I don't have because it's combinatorially it gets all a bit involved but that's uh, that that is the idea. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Nice. There are some virtual rounds of applauses. And uh, yes, uh, you may take questions. So feel free to ask questions directly or in the chat or raise your hands, uh, please. Uh, hi, Omar. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Super cool stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you about this um, category in which you interpret props. You said that it's you're treating it as a symmetric monoidal category itself, the category of models. But does yeah. it not have any sort of interesting high categorical structure or anything like that? The reason I'm asking is because um, when we've been studying similar things, we've uh, I remember you said that pros they don't have like an internal tensor product. Yes. So um, some idea that we've come across is somehow these, this lack of internal structure somehow gets pushed up to like a higher dimension when we've been working in um, pro functors, for example. Hmm. Uh, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't thought much about that question, I must say, because I've, uh, well, let's say I've, I've, I've used this idea of the category of models more for, as, as a way of justifying the of justifying how the tensor product is uh, is defined. Um, so I mean, at the at just the level that that people usually look at the category of models of uh, uh, that that does. I mean, it doesn't. If you if you take models in a, in, a, in just symmetric monoidal category, there doesn't seem to be any higher structure above just uh, taking monoidal natural transformations of these functors. Um, I so certainly yeah, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you took if you took models in in some high category then I suppose you would have some 
uh, but what uh, what you still uh, what you still will not have, I think, is uh, is a, a kind of a, a symmetric monoidal structure unless you start from a symmetric monoidal. So what, what I was thinking of is maybe this category of models is actually a symmetric monoidal two category. Um, and then there's this interesting construction on the two category of profunctors called the internal string diagram construction. I don't know if you've seen it before, um, but it allows you to talk about how if you have like a, a an algebraic theory presented by just giving the generators and relations presentation of a monoid or something, then because prof is compact closed, it allows you to relate sort of symmetry in the external setting versus symmetry in the internal category that you're trying to study. I was wondering if you thought about anything like that, but maybe it's kind of a niche question. Um, yeah, I think, I think you'll have to write that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I can I can I can ask you later over Zilla or something. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Actually, I, I had another question. If nobody else wants to go, please go ahead. Um, this thing about the spherical boundary condition, if you wouldn't mind going back to that slide where you had three diagrams, one of which did not have a spherical boundary. Yes. I was, yes. So I, I was just thinking that middle zero cell, um, could you imagine like degenerating that into a an identity one cell or something like that and producing a diagram to the top left and you're saying that those things are not considered equal or they're not modeled in the Thing, uh, yeah, so what you what you get at the well at the level of this shape category of, of, of atoms, uh, what you still have you have um, uh, well these maps um, well these maps have a, the, the the maps in this category still have a have an orthogonal factorization system where they factor as a surjective map and uh, followed by an injective map and uh, uh, restricts it, it which works in a similar way as uh, Kind of similar factorization systems and, and, and kind of more familiar shape categories like uh, in the simplex category you have these co-degeneracy maps followed by co-face maps uh, so that's you still as part of the of the structure of a diagrammatic set you get these degeneracies which uh, which uh, are uh, kind of duals of these uh, of these subjective maps and you get faces which are duals of the of the injective maps, um, so they, um, so yes, they they kind of give you a kind of note that they're well, they're much, there's a much kind of richer and more complex combinatorics of degeneracies than, than in the case of uh, of simplicial or cubical sets. But uh, yeah, the idea is that they give you a kind of notion of, uh, of, of weak units in the in the setting where, for example, you can do you can do you you will have a kind of a morphism from, uh, for example, from this from this diagram here on the left, you will have as a seen as a, as a regular directed complex, you will have a surjective map from this to this, uh, which just squashes this uh, middle, uh, this middle one cell to a point. Uh, so the idea that like the when you when you want to think of these kinds of diagrams, you kind of have to pad them with uh, with degeneracies and um, that's kind of uh, the idea is that while when I'm doing kind of rewriting with polygraphs um, you would be able for example to rewrite this kind of diagram directly into say something of this shape uh, in this context you kind of have to first pad it with a degeneracy and then and then rewrite it. I, that's kind of the price to pay for to have these nice homotopical properties. Is that I hope this answers your question. Yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. I have a question. Um, uh, please go ahead. So you mentioned that this diagram of 
um, these two uh, parallel two cells with the with the point in between is not um, among the complexes of our exact category. But do we have something kind of like, uh, say, in in theta two, where you have something which is sort of like these, but with kind of a third composite two cell added um, sort of analogous to the composite one simplex in the in the triangle. Sorry, I don't I don't think I, I understood. Sorry, let me let me phrase it a different way. So what I'm what I'm getting at is does this category indexing this this category of cell shapes for diagrammatic sets, does it contain theta two in the same way that it contains delta, um, where we don't necessarily need diagrams of this form, but we do want yeah, one. So this is, so this, uh, well, this is still, uh, this is still going to be a regular directed complex. And in fact, yeah, all the, uh, for example, yeah, all the, the whole, the whole theta category is still, uh, is still going to be, uh, sorry, I mean, theta category uh, with uh, only with, uh, with kind of cellular morphisms and not 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 all functions. Um, what is a I'm kind of getting lost. Is a anyway. This this diagram is still uh, is still a regular direct complex and it's still a diagrammatic set. We have an embedding of uh, the only thing that this spherical boundary condition is saying is that this diagram cannot appear as the shape of the uh, input of output boundary of a three cell, uh, which is um, so. The, the idea is that um, well, what I what, what I what I do in this in the uh, in this paper is also kind of define a kind of a plausible model of, of weak high categories on top of this. Um, so, well, in the in the idea where Kind of composites, uh, um, kind of composites are given by high-dimensional cells by high-dimensional compositor cells. What you what you would have is that yeah, you can't you can't directly compose uh, this diagram, but you can compose this diagram with some uh, degenerate cells uh, put inside it. Thank you. Right. Uh, are there any more questions for Amar? Uh, 